soul be subject unto higher, the higher powers. In Romans 13 and verse 1, and balancing that with uh, the book of Acts, chapter 5 and verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. So we've tried to balance those two principles and then also take into consideration, among other things, the testimony to our community. Will there be those in our community that drive by and say, what do they think they're doing with all those cars they're gathering? And so I just wanted to give you some feedback along those lines. Uh, my wife and I were at uh, an event yesterday uh, seeing some people um, in the community, and one comment specifically made to my wife was of someone that has driven by, has actually visited here a, a, a time or two, and has noticed that we're having services and went on and on about the testimony uh, that our church is uh, a testimony of hope, a testimony of light, a, a beacon in the community, that uh, they were saying that where they're going, they have not started to meet yet, and they're encouraged just when they drive by and they see that we are meeting as a church. So I wanted to pass that on to you. We were kind of thinking maybe the other way, uh, those would think negatively, but the actual explicit Verbal words that are coming our way are, you know, you're an encouragement to, to me, even though I don't go to your church just because you're getting together and serving the Lord. So I wanted to pass that on to you. That was an encouragement to me. Well, there's a phrase uh, that I heard somewhat often in the bulk of my Navy career. As you know, it was spent largely in the uh, airborne reconnaissance field. Uh, was uh, you'd see it on squadron patches on posters just different places trust but verify and I don't know if it was ever uh, actually uh, an official slogan of either of my squadrons I was in VQ1 or VQ2 but I remember seeing that a lot trust but verif uh, but verify and Wikipedia says guardian of all truth that it uh, is actually a rhyming Russian Proverb, and I don't speak Russian, so I can't attest to that, but supposedly that's true. President Reagan, amen. President Reagan used it on several occasions in relation to nuclear disarmament talks with the former Soviet Union. There's even a book with that title, Trust But Verify. The longer title is The Politics of Uncertainty and the Transformation of the Cold War Order, 1969 to 1991 by Martin Klimke, Reinhold Kreis, and Christian Osterman. Well, I think you just have a, a natural sense, whether you put it in Cold War context or VQ or some sort of other reconnaissance context, we have a basic concept of what that uh, rhyming Russian proverb is saying, that sinful man can say anything they want, but actions might be something altogether different, and so... Maybe we can't necessarily trust other nations. Maybe we can't necessarily trust fellow man, sinful man, all of us going back to our father, uh, Adam. Now, here's my question for you this morning. You could say we can apply it to other nations. You could say we could apply that thought uh, one to another, if we would uh, admit it, understanding the doctrine of man and our sinful nature. But can we apply that statement, that thought, to Almighty God. Trust, but verify. And you might think, maybe somewhat instinctively, no, no, that's offensive to say we can trust God, but we have to verify him, that somehow we have to uh, prove that he'll follow through with his, his words. So on the one hand, we'd say, no, he's 100% completely trustworthy, period, or exclamation point. He just is. And I would say that was David's attitude in the Psalms, the sweet psalmist of, of Israel. Over and over and over again, he testified uh, in, in song that he trusted the Lord. Let me just run down some examples. Psalm 7 and verse 1, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Psalms, uh, Psalm 11 and verse 1, In the Lord put I my trust. Psalm 18 and verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Psalm 31.1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. 
Psalm 37, verses 3 through 5, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And you're familiar with some of these words. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 62 and verse 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. And I'll make that a short pause and go on to the Word of God Psalm. 119 verse 42 in part says, I trust in thy word. So you'd say trust but verify? No, it's just trust. Trust, trust, trust this trustworthy God. And yet, as we were singing, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me. He said, we know the context, maybe you don't know, the context is uh, Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. So uh, the prophet being used of the Holy Spirit to speak to the remnant of Israel that were falling away from being the remnant, almost like now we need to look for a new remnant within the remnant of those that came back because they weren't living out a life of, of trust. So he's saying, no, 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 uh, prove me. And now herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Is there anywhere prior to that where the Lord said anything to the nation Israel about basically, you know, just trust me, do what I say, and you'll be blessed? It's called the Palestinian Covenant. At the end of Deuteronomy, just, you know, the conditions in the promised land, this one was conditional. The Abrahamic covenant in relation to the land was unconditional. It's your land, and our world would be uh, do well to understand that. But there was a conditional covenant, the Palestinian covenant of the blessings in the land. It shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all of these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And there are other continuing verses in, in that portion of the scriptures, De uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, that was the opening couple verses, that spell out all those blessings and then spell out the cursings as well for uh, uh, violating the word of God. So what about a New Testament Christian? That, that's something in relation to uh, Israel, the, God's covenant people. Well... In the Sermon on the Plain, there's kind of a similar promise, just uh, sowing and reaping. Luke 6, 38, one of my favorite verses, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So just all going back to Malachi chapter 3, prove me, try me, I said this, just go ahead and, and test me. And so that question, can we apply trust but verify to God? I would answer that in this way. In one sense, no, it's not trust but verify because that implies a repeated suspicion that maybe God is not trustworthy. But how about this? We'll modify it a little bit. Trust and verify. Repeatedly confirming over and over again the trustworthiness of our Lord and his word that he speaks to us and has preserved down till today. Well, I'd like to take that thought and put it in the context of uh, it being Father's Day of a father and son. We've got to get that in there somehow. And the, the father is going to be David. And we already brought him into the, the message today with all his songs of trusting the Lord. Son is going to be Solomon. The father David. Again, referenced uh, his complete trust in the Lord uh, throughout the Psalms. I gave just uh, a broad brush, uh, some, some of his singing here and there. Another one is Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust. So that's the example that David set for his son over and over again. 
I trust in the Lord. Son, Solomon, you can trust in the Lord. The Lord's given me promises, and he's followed through. He's verified them. He's proved them. And the same can be for you. The promises of God to David, the father in this case, were broadly spelled out in the Davidic covenant. And when we get to our text here in a little bit, what Solomon is going to reference in asking God to verify, to prove his word that he gave to his father, uh, it's going to be a somewhat of a sub, uh, subtext or a, a subset of the Abrahamic, or excuse me, the Davidic covenant, which is a subset of the Abrahamic covenant specific to the throne. Let me read, this is not our text yet, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and this is just part of setting the stage. This is the, the promise or collection of promises that God is giving the father here, David, uh, to some degree, to a large degree, uh, relating to his son. Uh, so I'm going to read from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 to 16. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, so this is God speaking to David, I will set up thy seed after thee. So now he's going down to his son Solomon which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house... And thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And this message is not necessarily on the Davidic covenant so much as simply looking at something that David was promised by God, by the word of God, that he tells his son, you can trust God, prove him, verify him. He's true to his word. I've given you all these songs. Sing, sing them, you know, I, I've sung them to you and you've you've sung them with me these songs of me trusting in him i want you to be able to trust in him and in our our text solomon at the completion and dedication of the temple on the one hand saying yep you're true to your word god and on the other hand saying but i really want to prove and have your word verified that you will continue to follow through with your your promises and as such, really, it's, it's a child having to appropriate the faith of his father, of his parents. His parents saying, it's my faith, but at the end of the day, you're just going to have to go out there, try, trust, prove, and verify for yourself that what God says is really true. So we have, again, Solomon here at the completion and dedication of the temple. Solomon praying for God's word to his father to be verified. So... Finally, our text is in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and finally 2 Chronicles. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm. I did that even without singing, which is how I, I think I memorized the books of the Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter 6. We'll start off by reading verses 12 to 18. And the uh, chapter 6 here starts off with Solomon addressing the people, and then there's kind of a, a break beginning at verse 12, and that's why it's a natural place for us to start. And he kind of goes from addressing the people to praying a prayer before the people unto God. And so we're reading part of Solomon's prayer here at the dedication of the, the temple. And a parallel passage would be over in 1 Kings chapter 8. But we'll read here in 2 Chronicles 6, beginning in verse 12. And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. For Solomon made a, had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high and had set it in the midst of the court. And upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven, and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven nor in the earth, which keepest covenant 
and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Thou which hast kept with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him, and spakest with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel, yet so that thy children take heed to their way to walk in my law as thou hast walked before me. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified. And there's a title for you if you're taking notes. I know all the fathers out there have a book with a bunch of blank pages, so you can uh, take notes. Uh, there's a title, Let Thy Word Be Verified, which now is spoken unto thy servant David. But will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house which I have built, exclamation point, and we'll stop there. Again, that title is part of his prayer here of dedication, and we could consider that part of our prayer. Let thy word be verified, but may our prayer be spoken in a way that would exude a continued confidence in God, verifying his word over and over again to us, and not spoken, not prayed in the manner of an ongoing question of whether or not we can trust him. So we kind of have that sense in your mind, let thy word be verified. Not that we're questioning, but that we're really confirming that his word has been and will continue to be verified over and over again. And I, as I think I've already mentioned, would uh, put this, this teaching, trust and verify, in maybe a, a parallel teaching or part of the same teaching of just the fact that children can hear their parents say it over and over and over again. You can trust God. You can trust God. You know, for 55 years, I well, I have to backtrack to when I was, was saved, really, which was in uh, the spring of 87. But for X number of years, from then till today, I've been able to trust God, trust God. He's proven himself over and over and over again. But at some point, our children just have to prove him verify him themselves. Here's an outline so you know where we are at any given time and where we're going. Point number one, go figure, God is trustworthy. And that, you could just say there's our one point message, God is trustworthy. But we'll call that point number one, God is trustworthy. Point number two will be this, even though we know God is trustworthy, man still questions. And we'll see that in uh, verse 18. He immediately, after, you know, let thy word be verified, he immediately comes back and starts questioning what God, if God would do what he said he would do. So God is trustworthy. In the middle point, man still questions. And then point number three, failures of trustworthiness are not God's. <laughs> They're man's. They're ours. So God is trustworthy, man still questions, and when we see failures in trustworthiness, they're not God's failures, they are ours. So this Father's Day, and uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there, this Father's Day, let's meditate on the scriptures about the trustworthiness of our Heavenly Father. Again, the title, Let Thy Word Be Verified. So God is trustworthy. I would just say exclamation point and move on to the second point, but we'll back it up a little more and we'll back it up in the context of Solomon kind of preaching here to the congregation and then kind of transitioning to a, a prayer at the end of that, that preaching. So we'll go back to the beginning of the chapter, Second Chronicles chapter 6, and his, his speech, his preaching to the people. Uh, start off there in verse 1, then said, and again, we're just making the point, God is trustworthy, and the fact that Solomon declares him to be trustworthy trustworthy and he says in these first six verses uh, God you've spoken it with your mouth well, actually he's not he's addressing the people now he's speaking of God this is before he transitions to prayer where he's speaking to God so he's telling the people God said it with his mouth and then he fulfilled it with his hands so let me 
You'll catch that as I read through here. Then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness, but I have built an house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who hath with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth. To my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build an house in, that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And again, back there in verse 4, we have just a testimony of God's trustworthiness, saying that which he speaks with his mouth, he fulfills with his hands. And the Proverbs say in so many words and in different places, talk is cheap in relation to man, but it's not cheap with God because of great value when he says it, his hands go out and, and fulfill it. And then uh, after our text, we stopped in verse 12, pick up in verse 14, and, and I'll read uh, two verses. Really, the the same thought, and he has again transitioned from preaching to the people and now praying to his heavenly Father. He said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven, nor in the earth, which keepest covenant, and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. That which has kept with thy servant David my father, that which thou hast promised him, and spakest with thy mouth, and has fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. So twice Solomon says the same thing. You know what? My, my, my dad testified of this, and I testify of this. When God speaks, he goes out and does it with his hands. The mouth speaks, the hands fulfill. The mouth speaks, the hands perform. You might say, in a sense, God is performance-based. You mean I have to perform to get to heaven? No, not that sort of performance, not our performance, but his. Again, what he says, his hands fulfill and his hands perform it. In chapter 6, verse 7 to 10. Now it was in, his, uh, in the heart of David, my father, to build an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thine heart to build an house for my name, thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son, which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house for my name. And verse 10, the Lord therefore hath performed his word that he hath spoken. For I am risen up in the room of David my father, and am set on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. So we have, again, just ongoing testimony of the trustworthiness of God, that he can be proven and verified and, and completely trusted. The mouth speaks, the hands fulfill, the mouth speaks, the hands perform. And yet in the midst of that, there's another little teaching I want to uh, point out. I don't know if it's a, a rabbit trail or just embedded within here. Just an interesting thought. Our heart's desires can be good and godly and still not the will of God and that's one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn in my Christian life um, related to variety of areas of my life and the ministry and and as a parent that we can have uh, good desires and God can say that's a good desire amen uh, how did he say it that it was in your heart thou didst well but you're not going to do it <laughs> have you ever been there and and instead of taking the praise of God that says, that's a good desire, we get defensive and say, well, if it's such a good desire, how come I can't do it? <laughs> if I'm following your principles and your word, how come the answer is no? And we get kind of anchored on that as opposed to, wait a minute, God's patting you on the back and saying, oh, that's a good desire. It's just not my will. I have something better in mind. Uh, and your prayer should be not my will, but thine be done. And if that's truly your heart, then just take courage, be encouraged by me saying, thou didst well. 
but thou shalt not. <laughs> In this case, build the house. And we can have good desires. Uh, just what came to mind as I was meditating on uh, that thought, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Does that mean everyone that desires the office of a bishop, it'll be God's will to place them in the office of a bishop? No, not necessarily. Well, why? Well, sometimes he gives us qualifiers and disqualifiers. In the case there, that was 1 Timothy chapter 3. He continues on and, and spells some things out, and it can be readily apparent. But what if someone has the desire and meets all those qualifications, and God says, well, it's a good desire, but thou shalt not. What do we focus on? Thou shalt not. We don't like to hear no. <laughs> so we focus on that as opposed to God saying, hey, this is great. It's a good desire. I just have a different plan. Heart's desires can sometimes be better fulfilled in our children. As the case here with David and, and Solomon. I don't understand that because David was a man after God's own heart, and Solomon's heart was turned astray by women under their idols. You say, how could it be done better by Solomon, who went astray, as opposed to David, who, when he was confronted with his sin, you know, had this broken heart and sang in song uh, against thee only have I sinned. Um, well, there were circumstances that Almighty and Omniscient God knew would be in Solomon's life, in the world that were not in David's life or were contrasted to this, this set of circumstances in David's life, and Almighty God said, you know what, it would be better during a time of peace to have all this building go on than in the time of warfare of, of David. Again, David could have just said, why not me? If it's a good desire, why not? And yet God's saying, I got a better plan. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be peace. Solomon, rest. I like the way that God says, you don't have to know Hebrew. I'll just tell you what the name means by saying it repeatedly. Rest, 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 peace, peace, peace. And his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. That's from uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 8 to 10. God in that, uh, in that instance graciously telling David what the circumstances were but we don't necessarily always get a detailed description from God of, of why something would be better in his purview to be done by someone else perhaps one of our children than us. So what do we do? We trust him and prove him and try him and verify him and he comes back again and again and shows that his plan was better than ours. And we have no right to sit there and whine and say, but why? Let's just praise God that sometimes he says that's a good desire. Just continue to desire good things. And sometimes it'll be my will to do them in your life. And sometimes it'll be my will to do them in the life of someone else. So bottom line, point one, pretty simple. God is trustworthy. Number two, moving on. God's so trustworthy, but man still questions. Oh, silly man, that would be silly me and you. Uh, and the last verse that we ended in, right after he says, you know, let thy word be verified. And after he's said everything up to this point, that it is, has been verified. And God is a God that follows through on his covenants and, and promises and, and has. And really, that's what he's there testifying of. He's there testifying, look at this, look at me. I'm on a throne and here's a temple and everything you told my dad, it's come true. Let thy word continue to be verified. And then those very next words in prayer are a question. Will God in very deed dwell with men on the earth? You know, the, the entire universe that he created can't contain him. How can we contain him in something that man has built with his hands? Uh, man 
generically questions God acting in man's affairs. This would be a sense of, uh, we would perhaps call it a, a sense of deism. I believe in God, providence, just this big, powerful being, and he created all, and pushed the start button and got in his rocking chair, and just occasionally, when he's bored with the newspaper that he's reading, looks up, looks down on earth, eh, and goes back to maybe reading what's going on somewhere else in the universe, you know, the, the, the God of the, the deists. And truth be admitted, we can sometimes get that way. When we read our newspapers and look at the news, we don't even have to go outside of our state, do we? We just kind of shake our head and say, is it a God of the deists that just kind of set everything in motion and then lost control and it's just utter chaos and anarchy down here? Where is God? Does he not care? And we can, we can question. We can, we can pray to him in the morning and, and, and pray, you're a God of covenant. Your mouth says it and your hands fulfill it. Your mouth says it and your hands perform it. Thank you for being a performance-based God. You say and you do. And then we look at a headline, and all that goes out the window, and we say, does he even care? And we question that God might not necessarily dwell with men on the earth, which is kind of funny because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> in, uh, uh, in a very real sense, directly answering that, will God in, in a very deed dwell with men on the earth? He is talking about the holiest of the holies, and the presence of God above the ark on the mercy seat there between the, the two angels. I understand that, but just make an application to that question in general. Will God actually dwell on this earth? Yeah, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the answer is yes, in a general sense. We question it in that general sense. Even if we accept it in the general sense, yeah, God came to earth and he dwells on earth and he cares about man, but does he care about me? Will God in very deed, deed, things with his hands, fulfilling promises, performing what he says with his mouth, with his hands, will God in very deed dwell with me on the earth? Do you ever question that? Well, I'm a Christian, so i got to believe God uh, is interested in the affairs of men in general, just not me. <laughs> That's one of those men or women of God, a, a child of his. I'm, I'm the forgotten child. He's, he's worried about everyone else, but what about me? Will God in very deed dwell with me on the earth? The answer when we all at times question that is yes yes he will not just dwell amongst us but dwell in us the very spirit of God the spirit of truth from that instant of salvation taking up residence within will God dwell with me well look inside look inside and answer that question in the affirmative does he care about me I don't know does he care about sparrows had a, uh, recently a tree felled in my backyard. And uh, why did you cut down a tree, you anti-environmentalist, you? Well, it was dead. Well, it was there for, you know, the birds to come and pick out little bugs and little sparrows to, to get, make holes as the inside rotted out and, and build their nests in there. Yeah, but at some point, we have a little bit of rain around here, and we have a little bit of wind seasonally, and I've seen in my backyard what happens when you saturate the ground, and then a windstorm comes, and a, and a dead tree doesn't go like this. It goes like this. <laughs> and we've been uh, blessed to not have this land on the house yet, but some of you are maybe familiar with how that happens. So we decided uh, to uh, drop that uh, in our control as opposed to a windstorm and uh, have some determination there of where it would go. Well, there were some little spare, I don't know what they were, 
we'll call them sparrows because it fits the scriptures in Matthew chapter 10. They were little birds. And as they heard, Ruva, 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 and then, ring, ding, 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 this is much more manly with a blade probably about that long. And it would have been over in about 15 seconds probably if he was doing it. But so, you know, the, the birds, the little sparrows are up there. Oops, don't let that fall off. I've done that before. And one by one, these little, ah, let's go find another place to live. <laughs> It was just, they made that sound, just like that. <laughs> their little wings flew. And we'll say that they were sparrows. And are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? How much is a farthing? I don't think very much. <laughs> you can do the historical research. We'll say not much. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. And I don't know how many we counted. At least a half dozen. Every last one of them. The Heavenly Father, the creator of those little beings. It's like, There's one. There's another. You're counting, but you've missed count. I saw one over there that went under the fence and went and found another place to, to live. One of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore... And hear this, those that might right now be questioning whether God dwells with you and cares about you. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. Simple statement, but please take that home today. Uh, and if you're not right there questioning in your life right now, we will all be there at some point. Just remember, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Man still questions. It's okay to question. Then just answer, though, in the affirmative that, yes, he is there. He indwells within me. And if I just quiet my voice, I'll hear him say, I'm here. I love you. Uh, I've said it with my mouth, and I'm going to fulfill it with my, my hands. God is trustworthy. Man still questions. And any failures of trustworthiness, trustworthiness that we see are not God's but they are ours and we know that because God can do anything but but change but lie uh, and God can uh, let's see what else I had to write a paper in Institute things God cannot do it's one of my favorite papers to assign and and to go back and I reread it uh, whatever I came up with but yeah, God, God can do anything but fail. But there was a situation in my life where I tried to trust him and he failed me. I, I tried to prove him and verify him and he came up short. No, you did. It, God can't fail. Uh, he will never fail in his trustworthiness. If there's a failure... It's ours. And how does he deal with us? How did he deal with this son, Solomon, here? When Solomon failed. It's interesting, the whole context here, and you say, wait a minute, but I know the rest of the story. Yeah, the rest of the story is God continued to show himself trustworthy, and Solomon didn't. I will be his father. This is back to the Davidic covenant. God, speaking to David, a father about his son, Solomon, God saying, I will be his, Solomon's, father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Chastening is not God the Father's failure. It's his love. When we're chastened, we don't say, I, I, I trusted you and I didn't get a bag of goodies. I got a spanking. <laughs> it was because we failed him and deserved a spanking, not because he's failed in his trustworthiness. He's at that point acting out of his, his love. I have a, 
uh, reference down here. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 6, but I also wrote down uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, the same thought. thought it would be more apropos to read it from the pen of Solomon in the Proverbs. It's wisdom on God's loving chastening. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. We should take delight and encouragement that the Heavenly Father loves us and is delighting in us and delights in us so much that he's willing to lovingly correct us when we need it. And that's not a failure of God's, that's his love. Chastening is not God the Father's failure, but his love, and a subset of his love is certainly his mercy, as was spelled out as God told David, but my mercy shall not depart away from him. And as wicked and awful as Solomon God and following uh, the false gods of, of all his princesses and concubines, hundreds and hundreds following their false gods, God's mercy still followed through and let him reign for 40 years, 40 period of, of, of testing. As his father David certainly knew of the mercies of the Lord. David said, let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of, of man. Why is that? Man is less merciful than our loving and merciful Heavenly Father. Chastening is not God the Father's lack of trustworthiness, but, but ours. Our hope, our confidence lies in the completely verified and completely verifiable word of God. You say, yeah, but we walk by faith. We don't have to have anything proven. We don't have to have anything uh, verified. We just trust him. Walk by faith, not by sight. Well, that's true, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But we sang it and we read it. God says to prove him. And he says that to us with the ultimate greatest confidence. You can say that to your child, knowing in the back of your mind at some point you're going to fail, your children. We would all say, amen. Rich, at some point you're going to fail, your boy, and looking out, another little one back there. Sorry, parents, you're going to fail that little one. Uh, Isaiah. No, you probably haven't done it yet. <laughs> that precious little, little girl, Emma, you're going to fail her at some point. You're going to prove yourself, I hate to say it, untrustworthy. But God says, prove me. And he says it with ultimate confidence that he will never fail you. God's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? This whole concept of verifying, proving God is, is interesting in the context of the life of Solomon. He's testifying here at the dedication of the temple. He's testifying, look at this. You've followed through on your word. Look at me on the throne. You've followed through with what you told my dad. It's really true. Even in the midst of that, he, he questions. But you continue reading a few chapters, and you find someone coming from a far land to prove what they've heard about Solomon, whether or not it's true. And that just kind of makes you go, oh, that's, that's kind of an interesting twist to the story. The queen, of, the queen of Sheba, she comes. When the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, this is chapter 9, now you're saying, wait a minute, I thought we got through the three points. And you're in, now you're going to, and it sounds like a whole other message. No, don't worry, don't worry. This is part of the conclusion. Just trying to wrap it all up here. When the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, listen to this, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. With a very great company, she brought all this stuff. She communed with him of all that was in her heart. And as I was reading that this morning, after going over the, the message, I thought, oh, wow, how many different 
types and illustrations do we have going on here? The Holy Spirit interweaving some different things. Solomon's proving and, and trying to verify that this God that his father trusted is a God that he could trust. And now someone else is coming to verify whether or not the things they've heard about him, his wisdom and his wealth, whether they were true. And what was her conclusion? It was a true report. She said to the king, It was a true report, which I heard in mine own land of thine acts and of thine wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. I'm not trying to now make us a type of, or Queen of Sheba a type of us or anything like that, but put yourself in there in application. She came to Solomon. We know the end of this story. She was saying, oh, you're so wise, and he turned out to be a complete fool. But have that now us, perhaps even more so the next generation, at some point, having to just not go on what we tell them about the trustworthiness of God, but striking out on their own and going to prove him with hard questions and communing with him all that is in their heart and prayerfully coming away with this thought. It's a true report, and the half has not been told. And that would be my prayer for my children my grandchildren. Stop crying, Mrs. Geist. <laughs> that that would be their experience, the next generation and the next generation. That they'd go and sit down and, and test the Lord with hard questions and he'd come through with flying colors and whatever we've been able to testify as parents and grandparents, the half would not be told what they find out from, on their own. I believe that's the testimony of our children. And I pray it'll be the testimony of their children when they're at that point in their lives. You can 100% trust the Lord to save your soul from the penalty of your sins for all eternity. This is your hope from a God that cannot lie in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And that would be a word of encouragement to those that haven't yet trusted the Lord for salvation. You can, do, trust, and he will prove himself to save you, just as he said when you call out to him. Christian, You've trusted a heavenly father to save you through his son. He's proven himself true to you over and over and over again. And may our prayer, the title, Let Thy Word Be Verified, may that prayer be a continued confidence in God, verifying his word and, and not an ongoing questioning of whether or not we can trust him. 
Do you have a situation in your life maybe that you're currently dealing with? Some area of struggle where you're just having a hard time trusting the Lord? You trusted him for salvation, but, but this is <laughs> not bigger. <laughs> but this is big. Well, I'm not discounting that. We go through some major trials and testings in our lives. If you're in the middle of one right now, I would encourage you to do this. Search the scriptures. Find an applicable principle, an applicable promise of God to your situation. Then simply pray in confidence to your heavenly Father. Let thy word be verified. Then go in peace and serve the Lord. <laughs> A simple thought, but one that Solomon struggled with. Uh, I don't know what the Lord needed to do with today's message, but I pray his will be done to his honor and glory. Let me pray to that end, and then we'll sing a song together to let God kind of wrap up with some praise unto him. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for being completely trustworthy, but then on a daily basis inviting us to prove that and to verify it. And I pray that that lifelong endeavor after trusting in thee for salvation would not be one of questioning, but just ongoing confirming. And as you prove yourself and verify yourself to be a God of your word over and over again, that we would be able to trust you for, I guess we could say, bigger and bigger crises in our lives. And... We just would want to thank you for your character and nature and for your mercies when we prove to be untrustworthy before thee. Thank you for loving us, the unlovable. And I do pray if there would be one that has not trusted you and the completed work of thy son for their salvation, that your Holy Spirit would not give them rest until they call out unto the eternal rest of salvation. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Levi, uh, over to you. I'd say as he's coming up here, turn to some number in your hymn book, which isn't in front of you. So uh, why don't we stand and get your blood going and sing unto the Lord.